Welcome, welcome, welcome. You are listening to Innerverse. My name is Chance, and this is kind of an unconventional episode here today because uh, Haley and I, Haley's my wife and also my co-host, we've been traveling for a couple weeks in California working on a documentary that we're putting together. This documentary is featuring our friends Colin and Finn. Um, Colin is a caretaker for Finn and a, a brother and friend of his, not a biological brother, but a brother nonetheless. Finn was in a longboarding accident that left him with a traumatic brain injury and he was basically a vegetable at the beginning of this recovery process and through the power of love and care and attention Colin is doing real magical healing work with uh, Finn and he's not the only one that's been instrumental in Finn's recovery but he's the one that hired us to come make this documentary and tell the story about what's really possible with with recovery from this type of injury whenever you take it outside of the hospital setting and um, and put your heart into it, put your entire heart into it. So uh, I do apologize for the episode being, uh, we're going to just kind of jump right into the middle where Haley is talking about the, uh, the nature of Finn's injury. And I was actually live streaming this episode on Instagram and YouTube and I messed up and didn't save the video from the Instagram live feed. And anyway, it was my first time ever trying to live stream anything. It was a learning process, and the um, backup audio that I was recording, I didn't start it quite at the beginning. So we'll be jumping right into the conversation at about the point that Haley is telling a little bit about Finn's injury. So, uh, you know, bear with me with, on this, and in the future, I'll schedule the live stream of episodes that I'm going to do that a lot sooner so that you guys will have more heads up and maybe check it out if you want. So... Uh, before we go ahead and get on to the episode, I'd like to thank everyone who is already subscribing to the podcast on Patreon. Your funding helps more than you know. And in fact, because of the support that you guys have been giving me, this month I was able to make a purchase of some new audio equipment, and we were using that in the documentary filming to a great degree as well. So it's very synergistic that I was able to do that. And uh, it's also going to dramatically mean an improvement in the audio quality of future episodes, and I know that they may not have been as as great as they could be. I'm positive of that, actually, especially for the last couple. So thanks for your patience as I learn how to be a better podcast, and thanks for your pledging on Patreon. And remember, the only support that the show actually receives is from people that are listening. So if you want to help make sure that I can get a new computer soon, then please go to patreon.com forward slash interverse or check the link in the episode description and you will be able to find your way there where you can pledge one, two, three dollars, ten dollars. There's a lot of options and a lot of different reward levels that I'm uh, providing for those different tiers of pledging. So um, help me get a new computer. I really need it because the sound card is actually broken on this computer. When I edit these episodes, there's a crazy crackling sound, and it sounds all wacky. And I'll be honest, it makes it a little tricky to know if I'm getting things right in terms of audio editing whenever it sounds really bad on my machine. So um, the sooner I get more support from you guys, the sooner I'll be able to get the, the next equipment upgrade that I need after the mics that we got. And that would be a computer. So... Uh, keep your fingers crossed that this one doesn't die. It's a little old. It's a laptop that's been through a lot of a lot of stuff. So anyway, with that being said, thank you for supporting the show. Thank you for listening. Please uh, share if you feel so compelled and make sure to check back next week with whoever it is that I managed to get. Um, if you know anybody that wants to do a podcast or you want to do a podcast, don't forget you can hit me up. You can contact me through many different social media channels or just email interverse.podcast at gmail.com. You guys make me uh, do this show. You're the reason I'm doing it. You guys are wonderful. Um, any interaction I get back from you guys makes me really happy, even if it's to tell me that something is needing to be worked on or fixed. Uh, I, I appreciate all forms of feedback. I love you all, uh, and I hope the best for you. I hope summer is really just 
kicking ass as it is for me. I love this time of year. It's where I really feel the most alive and like the most myself. So um, hopefully that's the same for you guys and you're you're um, warming up nicely. Okay, I love you. Let's get on to this episode. And um, oh yeah, one more thing. The Eureka contest I've been running is now over. So stay tuned and I will announce the winner probably next episode. Because of traveling, I haven't had the time to really produce an episode to the uh, the normal level of, that I would, and it's even a little late. So, thanks for the patience, thanks for the patronage, thanks for being awesome, and be good to yourself, be good to each other, and uh, yeah, we're gonna talk about this here adventure we just had. And also, don't forget that the music that we're playing here is by Cadella and Adam Johnston, new track by them. And I think you'll really dig it. So go find that in the episode link description too. about in 2015 in July of 2015 and got a traumatic brain injury which caused him to be unable to speak unable to walk unable to um, do anything Uh, he was in a coma for a little while and then was still paralyzed even when he woke up from the coma Uh, especially on his left side he was pretty much completely paralyzed so he's had to relearn how to do everything and colin using his experience in the past with traumatic brain injury which we'll get to has been able to rehabilitate help to rehabilitate him and act as a caretaker for finn so colin wanted us to come out there and just show what is possible through our uh, filmmaking that when somebody is in the position of having a terrible traumatic brain injury and they can't take care of themselves in any way anymore, um, that the hospital, the hospice care, the what your insurance will pay for essentially doesn't really give someone what they need to get to the next level of their recovery. When someone's got a traumatic brain injury, they really pretty much need somebody pushing them at all times. And whenever you're in a hospital and you have physical therapists and you have doctors, you only really see those people for a few minutes a day or sometimes even only a couple of times a week. And a lot of that time, they're actually just um, figuring out the answers to different questions on the paperwork they have to turn into the insurance company. So uh, with that type of injury, you, you have to constantly work, you have to constantly push. And when your brain is messed up, you don't have the, mo- the motivation that you need to actually be, you know, pushing yourself to try new things to, you know, try to get up out of your bed and and um, start walking again. So what Colin does for Finn and what he's been doing since Finn had his accident is waking up with him early in the morning, um, massaging his, his left side a lot, helping him get limbered up and stretch and uh, helping him get himself dressed. And from the beginning of the process, this was extremely intensive. Um, Finn was so, so paralyzed that they had to literally um, – sleep at his bedside and every couple of hours roll him over so that he wouldn't get bed sores. Yeah, they were basically doing 24-hour round-the-clock care. Uh, Colin and Colin and Finn's sister, Elliot, both had a really um, big role in this, uh, and they would have to assign someone to be with him round the clock so they could make sure that he was um, being moved and being stretched and... Um, being changed. I mean... Incontinence, uh, inability to control your bladder. That's another really common thing with brain injuries. That is Especially very whenever difficult. whenever you, your muscles are, um, according to Colin, I can't remember what they call it, but a lot of times after an accident, your muscles will be just locked up. And um, oh, yeah. it's just like a constant state of being locked up. And that's a big reason why Finn could not move or walk in the beginning was because everything was just so tight and tense all the time. Your nerves are like, the ability to, it's called storming is storming. what they call it. Yeah, your nerve endings just go crazy, and every yeah everything's just tensed up. Um, it's uh, definitely a common thing with with brain injuries, from what we are we have learned through this process. Yes, <laughs> did I interrupt you? No, no. Okay, well to uh, to backtrack a little bit, um, 
why why Colin was even involved with taking care of Finn and um, why he has the expertise to even do this is because Colin Colin's just a guy with a really big heart. He always does the right thing. He he's really honest with everybody else and with himself. So as a person who was really traveling the world when he was younger, he has gone on to Ireland, gone to China, and while he was in China uh, for several years, he dated a, a woman named Xiao Hua, and Xiao Hua actually was injured in a cart accident um, near what appeared to be probably the end of their actual intimate relationship. The The accident was a, one of those like three-wheel carts or something came barreling down the street and hit her friend who was walking next to her. And that friend kind of stumbled into Xiao Hua and knocked her over and Xiao Hua hit her head, boom, coma for a month. And when, when she went into her coma, all of a sudden a lot of crazy stuff came out about who she actually was that was different than what she had been telling Colin all that time. Like, well, mm. we don't have to go into it too, too deep, but it, it was just like, it was just suffice to say there, there, you know, there was a lot of stuff revealed that many people would just be like, well, screw this. I'm walking away, but she really had no one else who was going to take care of her. The hospital system in China is a lot more brutal than here. The hospital system in China is pay as you go. So if you're a, a coma patient, you know, if you're in a coma and you're in the hospital, you're looking at well over a grand, 1500 Well, I don't even remember what he said. It was definitely over a grand a day. It was like 1500 plus. And uh, that is, if you don't come up with the money each day, you're out. you yeah. don't get the care. You don't have your machines if you're... So if you're in a coma and you're needing a lot of care and a lot of help and you don't have that money every day, too bad. You don't get the care. And that means that you... I well, guess you just die. Pretty much die. <laughs> I don't yeah, know because she was in a die. she was completely in a coma for a full month, uh, may, maybe a little longer. And um, so Colin was asking everyone that he knew around the world for help and trying to raise money every day. And, and somehow each day they did it. Somehow every day they did it, and uh, different things would come up that would allow him to continue with her hospital care, just sort of miraculously. I think um, at one point there was like a Chinese TV show that picked up the story and wanted Colin to be on the show. And, and somehow that featured this hospital. And so if he did it, the hospital was going to allow her to stay there for a month. And he was like, no, I'm not going to do it for just one month. And then they're like, okay, two months. So Well, this was later on after later she was on. out of her coma. So this was more of like a, a hospital that was going to be doing therapy for her, cognitive therapy and things like that. But um Especially in the beginning, yeah, he had to raise a, a bunch of money, and it was not easy because he was also in school, and he was also a teacher. He had in to stay to in school. His visa, yeah, <laughs> in order to stay in order to stay in China, he had to keep his visa, and in order to keep his visa, he had to be in school. So full time school, full time work, full time taking care of somebody with a traumatic brain injury. That doesn't really. There's just not enough hours in the day for that. <laughs> it doesn't work. But he juggled that for a year or more, and. What's crazy about it is in that same year, his younger brother, Jonathan, was killed, and it completely devastated his family. So over in the States, his mom and dad are having a rough time with that while he's over in China juggling all this madness, brain injury, school, work, and uh, eventually he just, he was actually having to send money back to his parents so that they wouldn't lose that, their house. Like, So Colin was just somehow the center of all this crazy turbulence, and he asked his mom and dad, please come over to China. I just need some help right now. You can live here. Help me take care of Xiao Hua uh, or help me, you know, keep a roof over our heads. And his, so they his did. His dad took over, uh, what did he say, four four classes? Yeah, it's like I four or six classes, four, kindergartners. Yeah, he took over a bunch of Colin's classes because Colin was a teacher and he taught he taught English to to kids. He had, I know he taught several grades. He talked about having fourth graders and kindergartners and he had a lot of different ages that he taught, but he did teach English. Yeah. There. Well, Colin actually taught us a little bit of Chinese while we were there. We <laughs> should uh, give you guys a quick lesson. You so, want to learn how to count uh, to 10 in Chinese? Well, first of all, uh, uh, most people know this, but to say hello, it's ni hao, and that's hello. Thank you. Xie xie. And um, to say, to say, I'm like, I'm called you could say Wu Zhao and then your name. So I would say Wu Zhao Haley. Or you could do the little longer version and uh, it's, it's, uh, I'm sorry, it's not Wu Zhao, it's Wa Zhao. Wa Zhao. Wa Zhao. And to do the longer version, it's, uh, 
I'm, I might butcher it. Wadaming to sure. It sounds pretty good. Wadaming to sure, Haley. I am called Haley. Yeah. Wadaming to sure. Wadaming to sure. Something like that. <laughs> I, I'm sure I butchered it worse. Okay, but yeah, this is a little bit of a diversion, but let's tell you guys how to count to 10 okay. in Chinese. All right. All right. Um, R. Nope. <laughs> See, I already got it wrong. Okay, the one. E. R. R San. San. Su. Wu. Leo. Ji. Ba. Ba. Jio. Jio. Sure. Sure. So. E. R. San. Su. Wu. Leo. Ji. Ba. Jio. Sure. So now you know how to count to 10 in Chinese. <laughs> so, yeah, Colin was really, really fluent in Chinese, obviously, because he lived there for a few years. And he had some pretty wild experiences. We have capt we have a lot of the um, the footage from his time in China, actually, to work with in our documentary. He was uh, on a lot of crazy Chinese TV shows. Like, they have a version of chi like China's Got Talent, the same as America's Got Talent, you know? And they, they asked him to come on the show to promote the story of what he was doing with Xiao Hua because there's not a lot of positive propaganda to, to spread in China, I suppose. So he goes on this China's Got Talent show. They talk him into dancing. They're like, show us how you dance in America. And he is like, okay, I, I guess I'll do it. I guess I'll dance on Chinese TV if they let me have some filthy, dirty, grimy drum and bass. And so they did. He played um, just, I'm sure, just like some mad beats, right? And he 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 busts a move for several minutes. It's great. It's awesome. And then whenever they air the show on Chinese television, they replace the music with like goofy cartoon music. Yeah, it was pretty <laughs> wild. They just completely made him look like he was um, just dancing to this really weird kind of <laughs> <upbeat> <laughs> cartoon music. It was very strange. It was very strange. And but... Colin's like, those fuckers. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, he's really good natured about all of it. He's not an angry person. It's, it's cool no, to see. not at all. Not at all. So let's start from uh, when we left for China. So oh, when we left for California. I mean, yeah. Yeah, you we, know, went we went to California. We've California, just been in California China. for two weeks. Yes. Let's start from when we left for California. Um, we we left from Kansas City Airport. Didn't have any layovers. Straight shot through and landed in San Francisco. Never been there. Never Pretty cool been place. There. I've been there one time actually, but other than that, never been there. So, uh, so we we got picked we got on the BART, which is their uh, public transportation system. Talk, area. Talked to a few crazy people. That was fun. Um, you know, like just good old public transportation vagrants. <laughs> <laughs> they were cool though. I mean, they they were crazy cool. They were they were nice. Everybody has uh, has some kind of truth to share. I had some interesting snippets of conversation with random train people. But then we got to um, we're into California. Well. well, well. From the BART, we had to take an Uber to the house, and we got the BART driver who just loved to play... Uber um, driver. Yeah, yeah, the Uber driver. Backstreet Boys. I'm pretty sure it was NSYNC, right? Oh, <laughs> uh, no, I, I specifically heard Backstreet's back. All right! Yeah, either way, it was a boy band from way long ago that should no longer be played. I know, this is like a, a, a young adult male. That was what he was choosing to play in his Uber car. I'm not judging, but it affected his tip. Which of which he got zero because I don't think you tip Uber dri Uber drivers, right? Oh no, I don't think you do. <laughs> Maybe if, you should. If you do, then we didn't. Yeah. I will say that. But uh, anyway, we got to the house uh, after listening to some Backstreet Boys, and um, Colin immediately gave us his bedroom, let us mm -hmm. stay in his bedroom, and he went and slept outside on pads because he's just he just likes to sleep outside, which is cool for him. And uh, we we crashed out, and the next morning we got to meet Finn in person, mm -hmm. and. Finn is Colin's friend who has the brain injury, and Finn was pretty enthusiastic to meet us. Um, yeah, and later on in the week, he even went so far to say that we were way cooler than he expected, so that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we went to the aunts after that. And we First, <laughs> Colin was originally going to go to the aunts with us, and he's like, well, since I can't go, why don't you just borrow my car? And, and why don't you just take my ticket? Yeah, he gave us his ticket. He's so, so generous. Uh, that was really awesome, actually. That was even what allowed us to go. And the Anz is up in Northern California, Mariposa, Mariposa, near the Redwood Forest. The festival takes place at the fairgrounds. It was just total filthy experimental dubstep and bass music, headlined by Yeti and Space Jesus. And Space Jesus pretty much made me feel like I was teleporting out of reality. It was pretty crazy stuff. The aliens were definitely there for that set. 
I've never seen Space Jesus, and uh, yeah, I see what I see what the hype is about. He threw down pretty hard, I would say. We um while we were there in California, I actually uh got back in touch with a girl named Leah who I know from years ago. She's my older brother's ex girlfriend from a long time ago, but we've we've kind of kept in touch since that point. Um just a little bit within the past year and when we both found out that we were going to the uns we were like ah oh, we should meet up there and of course as life would would have it we actually just ended up getting there at exactly the same time like pulled in the parking lot at the same time and got out of our cars at the same time and we're like oh well that was easy we found you right away yeah and then we ended up camping together just by picking we by picked camp, the same spot accidentally same spot. so we were also neighbors and uh that was really cool uh really cool and to reconnect with her she had her boyfriend Jake with her, and we went up to Yosemite and uh, hiked for a little while. So. Yeah, we left the festival for a hiking adventure in Yosemite. Mm -hmm. That was pretty cool. I'd never been to Yosemite before. Thanks, Logan. Peace out, dude. Um, so actually, real quick, I'm going to update the comment on here so anyone that joins us sees what we're doing. Recap of our Cali adventure. And boom, that's there. So um, the aunts was just... Pretty damn sweet. You have all the amenities that are not really there at normal music festivals. Free showers. Free showers. I mean, that's pretty crazy. That's like the biggest, one of the biggest things. I mean, most festivals will make you tar, they'll make you pay at least ten bucks for a shower. For like one shower. For yeah, and uh, here it, it was free as much time as you want, which you shouldn't take a lot of time. California is in a drought, but you could take as much time as you wanted. And they also have running water, real toilets because it is on a fairground, so. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, and the indoor stages were really cool. They had a stage called Wormhole. Wormhole. And I think it's some organization that puts on really awesome shows in, in San Francisco or Oakland. But their stage setup was like uh, the Stargate portal or something. It was this big circle with all this crazy stuff being projected onto the inside of it. And it was like a sculpture that was coming alive. It was really badass. I'll be honest, I didn't make it to a lot of the late night music because I'm more of a run around from the crack of dawn and get and work to a lot of shit and i get a little tired in the uh, late night sets last year i was more up at night but i still well, had a really good time it was hard not to run around during the day because the moon tribe was putting on some pretty cool workshops in their tent moon um they st. are louis a bunch moon of st louis people yeah shout out st louis moon tribe yeah they are a bunch of st louis people and they had a nice big tent set up where they're doing workshops on reiki workshops on yoga meditation and sound healing using gongs and crystal uh singing singing crystal bowls and uh, they also did a workshop on water and how it retains information in its crystalline structure it was just a bunch of really interesting stuff uh, going down in the in the workshop tent so oh cool uh my uh, cousin sarah and my cousin noah are checking out the podcast what's up guys yeah we've um we've just gotten back from our california adventure and what was interesting about being at the aunts was the fact that the the moon tribe <laughs> the moon tribe is like people we know they they're putting on such an epic set of workshops and it felt like we were just at a festival back home because even though we we're on the coast we knew people from ohio we remember we knew people from costa rica it was it was really full of synchronicities. It, it was not like we we're thousand miles away or however far California is. I'm not good at geography. Yeah, it was pretty far. <laughs> yeah, so we even crashed in their tent one night. That was pretty cool. They uh they they came and found us at like three in the morning and they're like, hey, here's some blankets, you'll be all right. You can stay here. <laughs> <laughs> um so anyway, well uh, anything else to say about the aunts? Yeti yeah, crushed it. Space Jesus was killer. Um we saw our friend Marina there. She was working the fest. That's another person we knew. Shout out Marina. Who else do we see that we knew there? Yeah, and check out Marina's yeah. site, wanderwear.com. It's got all kinds of cool festival gear. She makes paintings. She has upcycled clothing, crystals, other metaphysical tools. I highly recommend that. And if you use the coupon code interverse on wanderwear.com, you get a 12% discount. A little plug for our good friend Marina there. Mm -hmm. We saw our friend Shitty Kitty, also a really cool burner. Yep. And he cannot be described. He is too crazy cool. Shitty Kitty. Shout out also to you. <laughs> so we left the aunts, actually. Yeah, it was only a two-day festival. Mm -hmm. So after we left, we went back down to Orinda, the Bay Area, and we started working on the documentary right away, pretty much. Yeah, we were filming as much as humanly possible, constantly filling up memory cards and uh, dumping them left and right. It was awesome. 
one of the first days that we started filming, we kind of got a little bit of Finn's morning routine, uh, which is very well planned out because part of helping someone to recover from a traumatic brain injury is really just plotting out every minute of their day to keep a routine and um, kind of train their brain to rewire their brain to do the things they do every morning. So wake up, do a little stretching, get dressed, brush your teeth, you know, take a shower, brush your teeth, make some breakfast. All of that has to be done um, in a, it, it's easier if it's, if it's done in, in, you know, in a certain order or if it's written down and you have them check off a checklist because it just helps get into a routine and rewire your brain to do those things every day. So um, their ultimate goal is to get Finn in, independent and so that's what's that's part of what's helping him to get closer to that goal yeah um at the beginning of his recovery he literally couldn't do anything for himself and and now he's um cooking for himself he's cooking for us he, he cooks for, for us, us. <laughs> yeah he made us really dank omelets it was awesome he's getting himself dressed he's you know making his own bed doing his own laundry mm -hmm. all these little things that might seem totally mundane but whenever you've uh, had a brain injury like he had the connections in your actual mind, or in your physical brain, I should say, are damaged. They're called axons, and it's like the wiring system. And whenever you snap your head back and forth really hard and your brain jiggles around too much, snap, 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 all those cords, met metaphorical, I guess, cords are, are cut. And that's what actually gives you like the order of operations on how to do stuff, lets you organize information in your brain. Um, You could, you know, whenever... We have some videos of him from earlier in his recovery, just trying to put some simple little donuts on a on a peg. A, a pole. It was like it was like the when kids have the toy where they have the different sized ring donuts from largest to on the bottom to smallest at the top, and they put it on that little round peg, and it stacks up in order. Well, it was it was one of those, and in January, he was trying to do it with his left side and had a lot of trouble in way more so than he did whenever we got video of him doing it this past week. And early in his recovery, he wouldn't have been able to do it at all because right. before some of the rewiring could take place, he would just look at the shapes and go, I don't know. And there's too many things at once to think about. And, mm -hmm. and because he's been working hard every day and Colin's been working with him and Colin's dad, actually, Colin's dad, Joseph, Joseph he's living there too and taking care of Finn on the uh, off days so Colin can have some days off. But they work together super closely every day. They they do stretching, he massages Finn's arm and helps him get it more mobile, and um, they sing together. That was really cool to watch. They sang a lot of songs for us. <laughs> Part of the reason why Colin and Finn are even connected is because Finn went to a school that Colin's mother, uh, Teresa, or La Teresa, was the director of whenever Finn was around around 13. So when Finn was around 13, he was going to the school. She was the director and she formed a really close relationship with Finn, often telling him about Colin, showing him pictures of Colin. And Finn grew to really admire Colin, even though Colin was living in Ireland at the time and he had never even met him in person. So after Finn got older, he and um, La Teresa maintained a relationship and kept in touch with each other. And um, one day, Colin was at a bar snowboarding he was snowboarding and he had gone to a bar for the for the evening and this guy approached him and he was like hey you're Colin and Colin was like hey you're Finn and so they finally met in person for the first time and I guess they really hit it off and became close after that point Colin's really easy to recognize if you know about him because he's got dreadlocks Long dreads. down to his butt yeah and he's got a really animated physical appearance and personality he's kind of yeah. like a, a living cartoon character yeah. So they uh, they were friends before Finn had his accident that caused his uh, traumatic brain injury. And because Colin had experience working with someone with TBI in the past, it was only natural that they would reach out to him to ask to help with Finn. And Colin actually felt compelled to do so because he knew that he would be able to help. And that's just who he is. He he uh, he always does what's right. Like mm -hmm. it's just very clear if you if you know him that. He would never leave anybody hanging that he could help. He would give somebody his last anything if they needed it. He's a remarkable guy. Yeah. So um, all that type of therapy that they're doing together on a regular basis, we managed to capture on film. So that'll be part of the documentary. And uh, the first activity we did together was we went to a place called uh, BORP. Yeah. And that's the uh, Bay Area Recreational Program. And it's a setup where people with disabilities, traumatic brain injuries, and, and other kinds are able to come in and um, they're able to rent these 
awesome modified bicycles that are they have all kinds of different bicycles that different levels of physical ability would be able to ride on you might have to be tandem with somebody else some of them are attached to each other but uh, they go there every week and ride bikes around this cool lake and we got to go uh, film that and and ride bikes with them so i got to ride one of those reclining bikes and you were attached to me uh-huh and that was cool because uh chance would be pedaling and steering and i was just kind of hanging out on the back making sure i got shots of um colin and finn riding their bikes with the camera so it made it a lot easier and it looked pretty cool to have some moving shots where we were riding alongside them so that yeah. was a lot of fun the people who worked there were phenomenal and we got some good conversations in with them and got to talk to them as well they were very motivated to help people with their recovery and help them have some actual fun and and um you know do something that would be difficult to do without the help because those types of modified bikes are hella expensive thousands to just buy. of dollars right yeah thousands of dollars but this air this uh board program people can just come in and no schedule no appointment just come in and ride bikes so it's pretty pretty fantastic um what do we do after that the next day uh was something that was really cool Finn, before his accident, used to be into spray paint art and tagging stuff. So um, one thing that Colin had devised for our time there to help Finn get out of his shell and do something that he'd really like to do was to create some stencils out of cardboard and get some of Finn's old spray paint cans and go out to uh, find a place to tag. So that's exactly what we did. Tell him about the place we went because it was wicked cool. Well, we went uh, down to a place called The Bulb. And there were... It's like a peninsula in the bay. It's, yeah, it's like a peninsula, and it used to be a um, dump of some sort, but now it's got trails and paths that you can walk on, and there are sculptures made out of repurposed material. They're just... Trash. Random... <laughs> they're yeah. trash sculptures, but they're awesome. Right. It's trash sculptures, but they're, they look really cool. They're, they're like just... giant people, like huge trash people. There are these rocks just jutting out of the ground with rebar, and people have done a lot of their own spray paint art on these rocks. There were, um, it was just a really, really cool looking place. So we took the stencils and we took the spray paint and um, ended up going and finding a nice rock and, and getting some footage of him tagging that. And uh, He seemed to enjoy it, and he had to climb on some stuff that was a little tricky for him, so that was uh, good, good for him. He made a tree. In yeah. the moon and stars. That's what he spray painted on there. Yeah, it looked really great. So that that's all on camera. And the next activity we all went on together. Well, actually, at the at the end of at the end of that, um, at the end of spray painting, we uh, had to go up this large hill. So um, this was kind of something that was a. It made it very apparent how far Finn had come because. Oh um, yeah, it was like a steep ninety a degree very hill. Steep hill. You're practically climbing up it. And uh, he got he got up it with uh, no, not really any help from Colin. It was uh, he did great. It was it was a uh, really fun to tag. And then it the last had time nice... he was at the bulb, he was in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. So he had been there recent, like before a few months back. But like it was a whole new fin at this this juncture. Yep. And he seemed to really like doing the spray paint art. And also, if anyone's like spray painting, you shouldn't just go spray paint stuff. I mean, it was trash. And we were at a dump, but <laughs> it's nothing. Nobody's property. It was a rock. Yeah, also, okay. I don't think it's really a bad thing to spray paint cool stuff on random walls, but that's my opinion. <laughs> it makes it look better. <laughs> so um, another thing that we did, speaking of, of rocks and walls, uh, we went to two we went to two rock climbing gyms while we we're in, in the Bay Area. Um, so that was what we did the next or the next evening, or was it that evening? I'm not sure. It all kind of runs together. Yeah, I'm not sure either. But the first bouldering or the first gym we went to was called Dog Patch Boulders. It was in San Francisco, and it had over 500 bouldering problems. Um, it was it was massive. It was a huge bouldering gym, and nobody had to worry about belaying anybody. Nobody had to worry about harnesses, and it was a beautiful experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what we like about bouldering is yeah. that bouldering is the type of climbing where you have no equipment and you just you just go for it like Spider Man and yeah, it was a massive complex. We we took our friend Colin with us, and he had actually been climbing a little bit like 15 or 20 years prior, so he had the shoes already, and he was really good at it and very determined to to kick the wall's ass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we had we just wore ourselves out doing that. It was fantastic. And the next day, we got to recuperate a little bit and relax because we went to Big Basin National Park for a camping adventure. Yeah, we spent a lot of time in Big Basin, and we camped for a few days we went on some of the trails there and Finn and Colin both climbed up this giant sequoia tree that was well over 100 feet tall and um, it was kind of slanted because it had fallen and been stacked. One side was kind of touching the ground and the other end was stacked up amongst these other sequoia trees and it was about 35 feet off the ground. So they started at one end and um, 
walk their way all the way up to the top and walk their way all the way back down. And um, that was that was really awesome. So yeah, balance is something that Finn is having to work on quite a bit because his left side is quite a bit weaker right now than his right side. And so he's not able to really run yet. But the fact that he's walking at all is like, they, no one was sure that that would even be possible. Mm -hmm. yeah, and That's one thing that his mom said is that when it comes to a traumatic brain injury, they don't really give a prognosis because everybody is so different. So sometimes people will be like, like Finn, and they will make a really remarkable recovery. Finn is still recovering. He's not reached his fullest potential yet, and you, keep, you do keep recovering after a brain injury, but um, some people never leave that vegetative state. They... Or they get a brain injury and then they're just there for the rest of their lives. Especially people that don't have someone to care for them directly and push them forward. Because if you're just in a hospital bed and you're just being checked on by a doctor every, like for 20 minutes a day or getting like 45 minutes of physical therapy, it's hard to motivate yourself because like, well, you can't do anything except maybe like sit there and watch TV or something. So what else? Are, you don't really want to do anything else, but you feel, you feel kind of cut off from the rest of the human experience, I would imagine. And, you know, you're... There's a, probably all kinds of things emotionally in, inside that you can't even express because your brain doesn't have the ability to send it from inside to your your voice. Like it's it's really it's really amazing how hard Finn has worked, and that's one thing he has said about himself is that I work hard and I take it one day at a time, take it slow. But he does make gradual progress every day. So watching that happen and unfold was in real time on our camping trip, seeing him climb on the big sequoia tree like Haley just described. Um, we played soccer with them for uh, so long. We played like three or four rounds of intense two-on-two -two soccer in the campgrounds. Yeah, he, uh, he scored the most goals out of anyone, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Colin's a real soccer whiz, though, and so that was that was really fun. He could... Uh... We got our butts kicked several times is what <laughs> Chance is trying to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah, Colin Colin might have even gotten a little easy on us, honestly. <laughs> he was just... He was playing the, um, you know, the point man, setting... Finn up for shots and then Finn would just put him in and I, I couldn't even block them a lot like several times it was it was really cool he was really hustling um you could see him taking longer strides and, and getting more confident as the game went on and like really working to get himself from one end of the, the little court that we created to the other and, and having fun um and what was cool about why we're even playing soccer is it's just like little spontaneous things that like, hey, let's just play soccer. That's actually what is instrumental in his recovery, and that makes Colin such a good caretaker. Because, like, one morning, um, the last morning we were there, Finn's like, I'm cold. And it was pretty chilly, um, but we weren't going to build another fire because we were going to leave in a little while. And, and, and he didn't really want to do anything because he was cold, and he was just kind of like, meh, you know, I don't I don't feel like doing anything. So we started doing warm-ups and, and kind of jumping around and being goofy. And after that, he was ready to play soccer. Yeah, and... Some of the other things that were just like clearly huge strides that took place while we were camping. Um, we played a lot of word games around the fire together. <laughs> yeah, one game was uh, where each person makes up a sentence or a phrase, and it ter each person gives their sentence or phrase, and you create a story, and you just take turns and you add on to the story with each turn. So we were being as crude as possible because Finn responds really well to crude humor. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it laughs a lot, and you know, so do I. I'm about five years old, actually. Yeah. That's, that's always been my, my humor style since I was a little kid, so I never grew out of it. So we made up a story about the ghost of Dave Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln. Dave Abraham Lincoln is Abraham Lincoln's secret brother, who is a ghost, and uh, he has a very particular diet. He eats ball sacks. Ball sacks only. Yeah. But he doesn't just eat them. He just consumes them to later vomit them because what happens is whenever he vomits up these ball sacks, he hits other ghosts with them. And when they're hit with these vomited ball sacks, they are stunned. Like they can't move. They're completely paralyzed. So what does he do next? He takes the he takes advantage of them being stunned by pulling down their pants and he tickles their butt with a goose feather. Mm hmm. And so that's the uh, that's the story we made up with Finn, and he was cracking up. And we all it's, were. It's really amazing to see because we have a video of him earlier in his recovery, and we have testimony about you know what it was like for him with his brain injury. And what you hear a lot from this type of thing is that the person is pretty much robbed of their emotional capacity. Mm -hmm. um, everything's just kind of flat and toneless and robotic. And to see him laughing, his eyes lighting up, uh, making jokes himself, and he doesn't tend to express himself beyond maybe one sentence at a time or two right now, but he's capable of doing it. And there were times where he would, he would actually forget, I guess, like sort of forget uh, the situation and just be 
a, a large part his old self. It was it was super cool to see. We also played twenty questions with him, and he's really good at that. Which word word games and just things like that have been kind of instrumental to him getting his voice back in in a way because whenever he was first recovering, it was just thumbs up, thumbs down, and then he kind of started doing saying things, you know, verbalizing yes and no, but he wouldn't really ever initiate conversation unless someone asked him a question specifically, and it would be as vague and short of an answer as, as possible. Yeah. Um, or even just, I don't know, but... Even when he didn't know, sort of. Now, he definitely tries his best to come up with whatever answer you, uh, to the question that you ask him, and they, uh, they, they sing with him, they do, like, uh word games and rhymes and things like there's there's one and this is kind of a verbal exercise and but it's also a body exercise and they made up a well i don't think they made it up but colin has this song that he knew from when he was a kid and uh they start out by going hi my name is finn i have a wife and three kids i work in a button factory one day my boss came in and said finn press that button with your, and then you pick a new body part and then you kind of dance and you push the button with whatever body part. Push then, that button with your elbow. Yeah. You put and your elbow you, in. you run through in order what body parts you go through. So it kind of helps with memory as well. Yeah. And Finn being, uh, having the crude sense of humor that he does. Like one time there, he was like, push that button with your balls. And <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, he got that's, that's just the sort of thing that they, that they do to work on memory, work on speech, work on, um, moving your body. Yeah, and they're just goofy, goofy, having fun stuff. Um, and then there's more cognitive exercises that he does with Joseph, like uh, Finn, Colin's father, Joseph, like word worksheets, um, association things like um, here's a, a couple of words, uh, cat, dog, mouse. And then you're supposed to write three more words that are in the same category. And it's just things like that that help your brain rewire these connections because really everything to even be able to access information and knowledge, it comes from the deep web of connections that you've formed in your mind from uh, one thing to another. And one of their main messages, it seemed, were it's, you just can't get that in hospital care. You don't no. get to do those goofy, fun exercises as much. You don't get outdoor therapy by camping. You know, you would never get pushed to walk up a sequoia tree. They might make you walk on a treadmill for 15 minutes and then your therapy's over and you go back to your room and watch TV. But that's, <laughs> yeah. not, what, that's not what helps people to get better. No, what helps people to get better, better is someone that can give them their whole heart. And that's what Colin does is he gives his entire heart to the situation, to Finn, who he loves closer than a brother. And um, because because of that, he's always like pushing Finn, hey, straighten out your arm. Hey, you can walk a little better. Hey, why don't we go climb on that difficult thing? Mm -hmm. And um, Finn trusts Colin completely. You can see it. And Finn also really does want to get better and work hard. And um, his motivation seems to be getting stronger and stronger every day. And that's why I really believe he can make a recovery all the way back to independence um, and uh, really reclaim a lot about his old self because he is a really adventurous, outdoorsy, um, funny guy from all accounts before his accident. And uh, I even kind of challenge the idea that somebody with a traumatic brain injury is, is dead and gone and that you've got a new person that you're, you're dealing with. In some ways, that's true because this person is relearning everything about how to live but as they do reclaim that independence, it seems clear that the person that they were is still there. If they, I mean, long-term memories are wired in a different way, apparently, than, than these like da basic daily tasks and, and information and organization. Uh, we, uh, we spoke to others who did have traumatic brain injury, and there was kind of a variety of, of um, situations. Like we went to Finn's school one day, and, and we talked to his teacher, and they have an adult school for people with this type of problem to, to go and be able to, with a group of peers, um, play games, do do mathematics, um, act, other activities in the community. They go on outings. Like today, your assignment is to ride the subway and well, not the subway, the BART is what they call it, and uh, get off on this stop and you know stuff like that. Well, before we had gone camping, we got to go visit uh, Finn's school, and uh, we, like Chan said, we talked to his teacher, but we also talked to some of the other students we had class with. And this was kind of something that's interesting and really demonstrated how traumatic brain injuries are different for each person. Yeah. One of the people that we talked to started talking about his accident. He told us that it had occurred four years prior and that it was from detoxifying from um, alcohol, alcoholism, detoxification, and that he had had a seizure when he was going through detox. His brain went without oxygen for like 20 minutes, and that's what had caused his brain injury. He also told us that he was about to go back to college and um, just, you know, a name of a, a bunch of stuff. He seemed really, he was very well-spoken. He seemed very 
put together, had a great interview, and after he left the room, their teacher approached us and told us that none of it was, like, pretty much none of it was true. Yeah, he had not received the injury in that way. He was not about to go back to school. Um, and essentially, he would be unlikely to be able to even tell you what he had had for lunch that day. And His accident was actually a car a car accident. That's how he had gotten his brain injury. And the, the story he told was someone else in the class's story on how they had gotten their brain injury. And he had just kind of picked it up the week before and adopted that as his own. Right. So it just goes to show that this person who appears to be all there, he can hold a conversation with you. He can look you in the eye. Physically, he doesn't appear to have any problems as far as like um, disabilities. Yet there would be no way that this guy could actually go out and function in the world and, mm -hmm. and like hold a job or take care of himself because his memory is completely fractured and destroyed. And he's still still deep in the recovery process. And um, it, it's kind of sad because this is exactly what causes the big homeless epidemic that we see in our country. It's people, a huge part of it. People with, like, actually, a side story here. At one time, Colin lost Finn on the BART, which is the, the public train system that runs through the Bay Area. And they were searching for him for hours and hours because he just got on, um, he got on the wrong... Or he got off at the wrong stop or got on without calling. I think that's what it was. He got on with when he shouldn't have. And mm -hmm. then the door shut and he's gone. So um, they're, they're walking around. Uh, so they're driving from stop to stop asking people, hey, have you seen my friend? He's got a brain injury. And all the homeless guys are like, hey, hey me too. <laughs> so it's like this is where people that don't have actual care being taken of them and um, someone taking an interest and giving up their heart and their time to, to help push, the recovery push. and push, people are going to just end up homeless, destitute, um, they're going to be those people you see talking to themselves on the street. And that's why we want to make this documentary is because if people can see the power that's possible of healing just through someone that actually knows the person caring about enough to, to sacrifice a couple years of their life, maybe even or a couple months or whatever, to just carry the torch with that person and, and push them along, you can give someone their life back as opposed to condemning them to just being lost it's and, and <clears throat> that's something that finn's teacher said and that's something that finn's mom said overall there just aren't a lot of resources for people specifically with a traumatic brain injury there's not a lot of foundations that work hard to raise money for people with a traumatic brain injury and a lot of times whenever someone has an accident like that they do kind of just end up falling through the cracks when it comes to care because there's just not enough people who are dedicated to helping. everyone's too busy with their own stuff like yeah. i don't have time i have to work i don't have time i i have this other interest and colin just gave all that up and that was back when he lived in china he gave all that up to uh to take care of his ex-girlfriend xiao hua and so he was prepared to do what it took to actually give finn the care he needs and luckily finn's family is well off enough that they're able to pay colin as a full-time caretaker in a level of compensation that's you know, fair for the, hopefully fair anyway, I guess I can't speak for him, but it seems like, you know, it seems like the situation is working for him. Like he, uh, he, he seems happy to be doing it. It seems like he's perfectly willing to live there and, and wake up and be at his side, at Finn's side every morning and, and, um, push him through activities all day and night. And that's like, that's huge. You're, he's giving up, um, uh, he's not giving up his freedom. I wouldn't say because he's choosing it. It's, he is free because he's doing it, but He's giving up a um, lot of time, a lot of energy. He's giving up like the, I want this. And instead he's saying, I need to do this because there's no one else to step up. And that's, it's really beautiful. It's really inspiring. And it's the, the story that we are going to be telling with the movie. And it's going to be awesome because we've actually got almost 300 gigabytes of footage and stuff. I actually saw Johan, Johan joined the call or the, uh, the live stream. I'll go ahead and shout out to Johan for being the homie. He let us borrow his GoPro. Oh man, that was such a that was such a great tool to have throughout. He really this. <laughs> needed it. Yeah, it helped a shitload to have that GoPro. We have a ton of footage for it. And uh hey, what's up fam? Yeah, thanks again, man. That GoPro was killer and I've got all the stuff that you had on it uh ready for you to pick it up. So um you're gonna love seeing what we did with with this. It's it's gonna be a beautiful story and I know Haley's gonna kill it on the editing process. <laughs> Okay, so where were we in the story? Oh, well, let's we had finish up the camping. Teacher, we had gone camping. Um, Something about Sunday on camping. Okay. After we left the camping. Well, what happened? We were driving up the uh, the highway, Highway 1. Oh, we were driving up Highway 1, and we saw this crazy-looking concrete building covered in graffiti, and there were people kind of walking up this this hill. It was this giant hill, and there was a cliff that just dropped off into the ocean. And on the top of this hill, there was this bunker that was perched on 
precariously on this giant mound of dirt. It looked like it was about to like fall off. Yeah, basically it was a World War II bunker where um, in the 70s, we actually Googled it. It's called Devil's Hill Bunker. And uh, people came in for a construction project and took all the dirt off of the top of this cliff around the bunker. So the bunker is literally positioned on uh, a, t a man made 10 foot wall of dirt and all the dirt around, like all the land around it was cleared out. So to even get up there, you have to climb some weird shit. And there's no door to this bunker, first of all. Yeah, no door. Um, if you want to go inside the bunker, you have to actually like climb up and shimmy your way through this this um, opening that kind of overlooks It's about the a two ocean. foot gap. It's about a two foot gap and it's wrapped, it's kind of wrapped around this cylindrical room of the bunker and you have to climb up on this little ledge and shimmy in. And the ledge that you're climbing on, you have like this much room for your toes. Like, uh, like 10, no, eight, six to eight inches probably. Yeah. And if you fucked up and fell from up there, you would be falling. Hurt. You'd be hurt. You'd fall like 12, 15 foot you'd on rocks. So anyway, Colin and Haley climbed up into the bunker. We have GoPro footage of that and <laughs> it's, it's just really full cool. of graffiti, smelled like weed in there. Um, <laughs> probably beer too. Yeah, beer like too. That. Yeah. Um, definitely been some people's anarchist hideout or something for a long Party time spot. there was pretty cool graffiti on it though so anyway we, we were on highway one and we saw this place and we we're like okay let's turn around let's go back let's go look at it like look at it and check it out so we turned around and parked and made our way over and um finn climbed up there was a there was no doorway into the bunker but there was a a doorway that led just back a little bit it was like a very short tunnel and people just kind of it was just like a little graffiti Oops. room, I guess. And Finn climbed up the big ten foot dirt wall up into the up into the area and um that was just one of his feats of Yeah, he climbed the it weekend. by himself. It was just his choice. He he charged right up there and was like, I'm getting up here and seeing this cool cellar of this bunker. <laughs> so after we left the bunker, we were going back to the car and there were two options. You could either walk along the road or you could walk on the other side of the – there was the highway, there was the railing, or you could walk on the other side of the railing, and you would be walking across this probably one-foot-wide pathway that dropped off into the ocean. Yeah, oh, like, rocks and then the ocean. Yeah, a lot of rocks. <laughs> yeah, it was about a 150-foot drop. Like, if you if you fell off, you'd be – you'd probably be done. Yeah, yeah, you'd be done. You'd be done. So Colin and Finn approached this, and Colin was like, hey, Finn, look. We can either walk across the – walk along the highway – or we could take this route by the ocean. And Finn Finn's like, I'm doing the hard right thing. Up and started walking across this tiny pathway and uh, all the way down back towards the parking lot over this 150 foot drop. So that was really awesome. That yeah, was really, really it's amazing cool. because just just a month before he probably wouldn't have been able to do that to summon the courage or to have the balance to safely do it. Mm -hmm. So that's just what Colin does for Finn is uh, allows him to push past um, fear and limitation and do things he wouldn't otherwise do. Um, there were several examples of it. Actually, when we were at that place, the bulb, where uh, all the trash sculptures were and things, where Finn spray paint tagged one of the concrete walls, there was this teeter-totter of this big, long two-by-four on uh, like some kind of balancing thing. It was not a real teeter-totter. It was like totally It was just a long ghetto. <laughs> forward on a fulcrum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he got Finn on one end of it, and, um, and Colin stood on the other end of it, and Finn got raised up in the air like eight or ten feet and just balanced there and was like <sighs> breathing and balancing and it was like a karate kid ninja training moment so was the walking along the uh the coastal highway and on the really really narrow ledge it was super cool to watch and of course we have awesome documentary footage of all this and the amount of trust that finn has with colin is so apparent when he was up on the um the teeter-totter i guess you can call it <laughs> uh he was you know several feet up in the air and you could tell he was kind of nervous and he was like i want to get down and colin said hey no you're fine you're fine just remember to breathe and so he just sat there and started breathing and um didn't you know didn't didn't uh what, what am I trying to say here? He, he didn't he didn't hesitate. He yeah, didn't, didn't falter. hesitate after that. Yeah, he they've definitely done some breathing exercises together, meditation and, and mindfulness practices. And um, you could tell that Finn's focus is getting stronger and stronger all the time. Mm -hmm. Another thing we did while we were out that day was we went to the beach and climbed up some really steep rocks and up and down a really big hill. All stuff that Finn was able to do with very little assistance and very bravely like walked out across the rocks on the shoreline over to a big cliff and climbed up it. Um, also got footage of all this. It's going to look very nice in our movie. But if you asked Finn what his favorite part of the weekend was, he would tell you food, which yeah. brings us to the next thing. Yeah. California has awesome food. If you are a picky eater, plenty of vegan options there, plenty of the gluten-free if you're into that whole thing. So um, that, We ate very well. We ate very well. Colin took 
way too good of care of us when it came to food and uh we were never hungry and yeah, we, we always either, had delicious food. We either ate out at vegan restaurants or we cooked huge meals. Cooked huge meals. <laughs> we had some awesome campfire meals actually. Yeah. Really Haley is super creative and great at throwing stuff together out of just whatever's available. So we had some really dank fruit, um, granola bowls and Cliff salad. Cliff salad we <laughs> called it. Yeah, we crunched up uh, crunchy cliff granola bars and had like berries and fruit and uh, all we put all all, this was really cool. I recommend doing this. Slice up some bananas and pour some almond milk into a pot with the bananas and heat them up. Just and bring it to a boil, like a low boil, and just mush it, and it'll eventually get to like a pudding consistency. Yeah, it's like this porridge, and then you add that to a bowl with uh, the cliff bars. with granola and with like with berries and strawberries and apple slices and stuff like that, and you've got dessert for breakfast, and it's like so good. amazing. Uh, yeah, try that out. <laughs> okay, so um, I guess we can finish up what else, what else, what all else we did with them. We got interviews with his sister, with his mom, with, with Finn's dad. Um, we were able to get really detailed interviews of Colin and, um, activity wise, interviewed Finn as well. yeah, I interviewed Finn as well. Mm -hmm. Activity wise, the last couple of days that we were there, were dedicated to gathering those interviews and being able to make sure that we tell the story perfectly well. Awesome food hack. Yeah, <laughs> seriously, you got to try that out. It's really good. Um, what other genius thing did you do while we were uh, that was a uh, cooking oriented. Oh, oh stuffed mushrooms. Tell them about stuffed that. Mushrooms. This is a good tip too. Try this out. Yeah, you can just buy some uh, vegan cream cheese and you get the plain unsweetened kind. Throw that in a bowl and then take mushrooms and pull out the little stem and gills and chop that up super fine and add that to your cream cheese. Then just throw those guys in the oven for no, a no, while. No, no, no. We also chopped up really tiny onion and really tiny jalapeno. Oh, I wasn't done. I wasn't oh, done. okay. Yeah, but you can add other things. We added some jalapeno and onion to the mushrooms and cream cheese and then just mash it all together. Put the tops of the mushrooms in a pan and um, also I added a little bit of um, breadcrumbs into that and then you scoop that into the mushrooms and throw them in the oven and bake them. They're super easy, super delicious. Baked stuffed mushrooms. Baked stuffed mushrooms. Yeah, um, if you couldn't tell, we haven't had dinner yet and we're a little hungry. This, this <laughs> it's is on our... the brain, it's on the brain. Oh wow, so it looks like Instagram is giving us a time limit on our live stream. I didn't know that they did that, but that's okay. I think that we're probably uh, close enough to the end of our story to wrap it up because we, we can't give everything away. We, we, right. have, a we have a documentary to show you guys. Yeah. So we had a lot of really cool experiences there. We uh, were way beyond um, blessed to be able to spend the time with Colin and uh, Finn and Joseph. And uh, we just we felt so welcome there. And it was really cool. They to, made us a part of the family. After, after seeing the videos, especially of how Finn, uh, how, how Finn was in the beginning, how Finn was six months ago, how Finn was in January versus how he is now. The progress that he's making is so rapid and so inspiring that it was just, it was, it was, it was remarkable. It was so remarkable. yeah, um, thank you, Sarah, and Noah, and my mom for joining the live stream and everybody <laughs> else that checked it out. And thank you for everyone that's listening to the post later on. And watch out for our documentary later this summer, hopefully. And uh, what else can we throw in there? Oh, the, really, the most important thing to take away from this is. If there's somebody in your life that needs help, that needs care, needs someone to care about them, care for them, that person could very well be you and listen to your conscience and heart and know know whether or not that's the case because um, it's it's really it's really unstoppable the power that love can have to to fix anything. And so. advice from Finn is to um, enjoy all of the small things and appreciate all of the uh, little things that you're able to do because that leads to the bigger things. So. That was that. It that was that. ended a little early. Oh, shit. I didn't save it. I just no. hit done without saving it. No, no really. I okay. did. Yeah, that wasn't saved. I fucked up. That pumps me <laughs> out. I actually literally wanted to save it. Oh, well. We're still on Google Hangouts. <laughs> and I recorded the uh, the combo on our microphones here. So it's... Cool. Yeah, we, we have now something. We can take care of our dinner situation and we'll have a good podcast for yep. you to use. Yeah. So, all right. We're signing off. Sayonara.